Hello and welcome to Dissecting Philosophy with Dr. MacDonald. In this episode, we'll be reading and discussing the section Love of One's Neighbour. And we'll also have a discussion of the film Mrs. Doubtfire that'll fit into it as well. So, as we're covering the section of Love of One's Neighbour, I thought it would be a good idea for us first to have a wee brief discussion and going over of the section that deals with loving your neighbour in the Bible. And this section is the parable of the Good Samaritan from Luke 10, 25 to 37. So let's read over it and then have a nice wee discussion of it. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he travelled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. So, the parable ultimately is about how do you inherit eternal life, ultimately to love God and to love your neighbor as yourself. And your neighbor, precisely, is another individual that you'll take care of, look after, and love as if they were you. So regardless of their social and cultural background, regardless of their race, sexuality, and so forth. And so it's not a easy thing to do as well, because most people would just overlook and pass by another person that's in need. And you also get the an easy example here of someone whose car is broken down and clearly needs assistance on the side of the road. Let's say they don't have any immediate sense of having called for roadside assistance and so forth the car hoods up and they're trying to figure out exactly what's gone on most people would just pass by that person and not help them whatsoever but here it's saying well actually no it's a good thing to go and help someone who's in need and not just to pass on by even though that's what the majority of people would do would just be to just continue walking on and, of course, the person who that they're helping as well has been done wrong. They've been robbed. They've not themselves done anything wrong whatsoever. And so you're helping as well a good person straight from the get-go. But most people would just walk on by that good person. And then, as well, the Samaritan sort of goes over and above what's expected as well. Because he also then puts up lodgings for the poor person that's been robbed as well as then says, it's okay, I'll then compensate you for any extra that may pop up as well. So not only does he look after him, but he also makes sure that he's going to be cared for and looked after even when he's not there. So he's gone completely beyond call of duty in the sense of 
making sure that the person's okay and then also making sure that they're going to be okay even when he's not even there and it's such a fantastic wee section as well because it builds upon the whole ethics of loving your neighbor and loving your neighbor taking care of that person committing ultimately a completely selfless act in order for to love the other person regardless of their social and cultural background regardless of their race if they're in need commit the selfless act and go and help them and go and care for them and so this parable of the good samaritan then sort of forms the background to the section of loving one's neighbor and nietzsche is going to be critical about this whole selflessness that's involved within it so let's get cracking on with the nietzsche of love of one's neighbor you crowd together with your neighbors and have beautiful words for it but i tell you your love of your neighbor is your bad love of yourselves you flee to your neighbor away from yourselves and would like to make a virtue of it but i see through your selflessness the you is older than the i the you has been consecrated but not yet the i so man crowds towards his neighbor do i exhort you to love your neighbor do i exhort you rather to flight from your neighbor and to love of the most distant higher than love of one's neighbor stands love of the most distant man and of the man of the future higher still than love of man i account love of causes and of phantoms this phantom that runs along behind you my brother is fairer than you why do you not give it your flesh and bones but you are afraid and you run to your neighbor you cannot endure to be alone with yourselves and do not love yourselves enough now you want to mislead your neighbor into love and gild yourselves with his mistake i wish rather you could not endure to be with any kind of neighbor or with your neighbor's neighbor then you would have to create your friend and his overflowing heart out of yourselves you invite in a witness when you want to speak well of yourselves and when you have misled him into thinking well of you you then think well of yourselves it is not only he who speaks contrary to what he knows who lies but even more he who speaks contrary to what he does not know and thus you speak of yourselves in your dealings with others and deceive your neighbor with yourselves thus speaks the fool mixing with people ruins the character especially when one has none one man runs to his neighbor because he is looking for himself and another because he wants to lose himself your bad love of yourselves makes solitude a prison to you and so we have nietzsche being critical of the selflessness involved in loving one's neighbor which initially might seem like quite a strange idea because loving of one's neighbors initially seem to be as really selfless you are loving and caring for another individual regardless of their belief regardless of their race and so forth however nietzsche is saying well yes what they're doing is a good action of course it is but what they're doing in the first place is in order to basically score merit points towards securing their own afterlife for themselves so what initially appears as a selfless action and it is definitely still a good action has the motivation behind it of i'm only committing a good action because if i commit an action that's good i will enable myself to achieve the best form of the afterlife possible and underlying that because it has its relation into the afterlife and living forever as it says in the gospel of luke there then it undermines the very action itself so what initially then appears as something that's quite selfless is very much self-interested because the person is only going to be interested in committing the good action in order towards their own benefits and their own form of happiness in the afterlife and then we get this sense as well of the person helping out the neighbor being really hollow as an individual as well they have really no personal identity for themselves 
And it comes out in that line, one runs to his neighbor because he's looking for himself and another because he wants to lose himself. In the sense of we have, again, that psychology being developed out here by Nietzsche in the sense of who are the kind of people that believe in the afterlife and those people are going to have a very negative opinion about themselves, view their own body negatively, view the world negatively, what's going to be viewed positively, everything they can do to try and achieve the best form of the afterlife. And how are they going to do that is follow these ethical tenets. But in doing so, and folding back into previous sections as well, they become very hollow individuals with really no identity whatsoever for themselves because they're not focused on living and enjoying their life in the present, but they're focused solely in the future about that future state of the afterlife. And so when you say, who are you as an individual? In the case of the person doing the caring, it's almost like this complete plastic actor performance of what a person would be like that you have developed out here. In the sense of when anybody speaks about you, it's always in terms of this ideality and not really you as a person that comes out. And that's exactly what Nietzsche says as well when he says, you invite in a witness when you want to speak well of yourselves and when you have misled him into thinking well of you you then think well of yourselves so it's in the sense of it's only when somebody else is given this performance of who you are this sort of ideal that you then say oh yeah that is me but the point is no it's not that's just a completely made up version of how somebody else sees you that's not necessarily exactly who you are as a person. So continuing on then, it is the distant man who pays for your love of your neighbour. And when there are five of you together, a six always has to die. I do not like your festivals either. I have found too many actors there, and the audience too behaved like actors. I do not teach you the neighbour, but the friend may the friend be to you a festival of the earth and a foretaste of the superman i teach you the friend and his overflowing heart but you must understand how to be a sponge if you want to be loved by overflowing hearts i teach you the friend in whom the world stands complete a vessel of the good the creative friend who always has a complete world to bestow and as the world once dispersed for him so it comes back to him again as the evolution of good through evil as the evolution of design from chance may the future and the most distant be the principle of your today in your friend you should love the superman as your principle my brothers i do not exhort you to love your neighbor i exhort you to love of the most distant thus spoke Zarathustra. So wrapping up the re section then, we have Nietzsche's view come out. It's not the neighbor that he's going to be arguing for, but rather the friend. And how does this differ from the view of the neighbor? Because the neighbor is completely viewed in terms of who's doing the caring and loving for the neighbor. And that person is incomplete themselves and then also views the neighbor in terms of that ideality that's being created as well. So there's two forms of sort of denial. Denial of oneself and who you truly are as a person. And that's developed through, of course, lack of loving life. And then also having this image created about another person as well and loving them through that image denies you to appreciate who the actual person truly is and so there's this falsity and ideality and performance that's at work within the whole neighbor discussion 
Whilst in the friend, then, we have a move towards the creative friend who has then a complete world to bestow upon us. And what exactly does that mean? It folds back into our previous discussion of the section of the friend. So the friend then allows us to reflect upon our own views in a very positive way, allows us to have a critical reflection upon what we think and allows us all to develop in a very positive way, challenging us, others challenging their views, having a nice reciprocal sort of relationship going on, and where we're automatically starting to see the differences here in that reciprocal relationship, critical thinking at work, allowing views to develop, allowing them to change, embracing novelty as well. That's that line the evolution of design from chance, embracing the wee novelties and chance things that happen. Whilst in the example of the neighbour, none of that takes place, of course. Everything is purely in the power position of the carer. They're enacting the ethical principle of the Good Samaritan. Then there's no process of reciprocation taking place. There's no room for movement. There's no engagement question and why and so forth from the opposite side is all you will do what I say you will have this care because it is good I say it's good and you will receive it rather than having all that critical discussion and reflection upon exactly what's going on what is the idea of good with a capital G and so on and that's what we get through the friend. We have all that critical discussion. We have all that development of our own thoughts, challenging who we are. How to be a sponge, basically, as he says. We've got to be a bit more of a sponge in the sense of we've not only got to then take in what other people are saying to us, other people, and absorb it in like a big watery sponge in order for us to develop at the same time and not just sort of adopt this tenant and just enact it every single time be the sponge in the sense of allow others to affect how we think allow things in the world environments culture and so forth all to have a nice positive way on how we develop as individuals how our ideas develop rather than just all block it off by completely adopting one principle tenant or ethical principles of how we should live our lives and that's the way in which we should get into that little last section i do not exhort you to love of your neighbor i exhort you to love of the most distant in one way you could say well nietzsche hold on a tick are you not just arguing for a form of metaphysics here are you not just arguing for the form of the afterlife why are you focus so much on everything that's distant doesn't that mean that there's some sort of form of the superman into what exactly is metaphysical in the afterlife and so forth and it goes back into precisely those points said about the friend as well saying well on the opposite side of things if we look at the future of let's say the world and humanity as well is a very much more beneficial way on how we can help develop things in the world and develop our own thoughts and uh, also tackle problems in the world in a much more practical way and so it should be more thought of in terms of the here and now and problems that we could think of in the future that we could help benefit ourselves in the here and now rather than the focus on the afterlife and of course it goes into always that fantastic line as well man is something that should be overcome why is that the case because man is ultimately something that's pessimistic hollow follows herd mentality how do we overcome that we have to move towards the superman what is a move towards the superman well is to ultimately move that way back into developing ourselves as individuals away from herd mentality away for us to become creative individuals a way for us to have a more beneficial approach to how we think about the world our bodies developing our ideas and not a focus on the afterlife the soul and so forth so i thought a great movie 
to discuss for this section is Mrs. Doubtfire from 1993, directed by Chris Columbus and starring Robin Williams. And a brief sort of synopsis of the plot is that Robin Williams' character and Sally Field's character go through a divorce and he's only able to see his kids once a week. And so he would like to see them more than once a week. And so his wife advertises for a nanny because she can't look after the kids 100% of the time because she's got work. And so Robin Williams' character thinks it would be a great idea if he could be the nanny, which his wife is completely against the idea of. So, long story short, of course, he decides to dress up in this old lady attire and ultimately becomes Mrs. Doubtfire as a character. And so we have that sense of a good Samaritan sort of parable here in the sense of you have ultimately a dad doing something in order to ultimately spend time with his children, care for them, love them, and look after them. But on the other hand as well, that we also have Sally Field's character makes the point of he sort of lives vicariously through his children. And so the very first time you meet Robin Williams' character, they're all sort of just jumping about and jumping around and having lots of fun because, of course, it's a birthday party. And it sort of went over the top a little bit. And that's sort of like the straw that broke the camel's back, as they say. And then that's the whole thing that sets the whole divorce in motion as well. But it's that point that really Robin Williams' character in the movie is just ultimately living through his children and has not really become an adult at all as of yet for himself. That is to say, in the Nietzsche sense as well, is just ultimately living through the kids and through the kids is just a big kid himself. And it's really through the course of the movie that he sort of develops as an individual develops, as a parent develops the whole sense of responsibility and so on through caring for the kids. On both sort of sides of things as well, we've got that great idea of loving and caring and then also that sense of needing to and not only love and care for another individual, but also through our development of ourselves as individuals, we also respect and care for another individual and accept them for who they are rather than just us trying to put our own image of ourselves upon them or accept whatever image that's told to us of somebody else. So it's definitely a fantastic movie, very hilarious, very highly recommended as well if you've not seen it. Many thanks for listening to the episode. I hope you enjoyed my discussion of the section Love of One's Neighbour from Nietzsche's The Spoke Zarathustra. Feel free to drop me an email at my address, dissectingphilosophy at gmail.com, and I can also be found on Twitter at I am a rubber man. Many thanks for listening, and I hope you join us next time.